every part of this planet is covered in a cloud of microbes. Do you want some of my saliva? Not me! So now you can really see the books. Every organism, every multicellular organism, every plant, every animal, all the different multicellular organisms, they're covered also in a cloud of microbes. This is earwax. Really? Earwax? Ew! What, what I'm interested in is this sort of invisible world of microbes that we've been ignoring, mostly. We think that the microbes that are on our skin and in our mouth and in our gut and in our pet and in our plants and animals, they play important roles in our health. And so we'd really like to get people to think about them more. These are like um, baseball card equivalents for all the microbes that we got from collecting samples from sporting events and other events from all around the country. We went around to all of these events and had people at the event swab their phones and their shoes and some other parts of the events and we characterized the microbes on them. So Bacillus tequilensis, where we found it? In the candy jar at the set of the Today Show. Why it's awesome, the microbe produces a compound that has been shown to inhibit the growth of pathogenic bacteria. This is one from the Ben Franklin statue. And you really get a sense they're everywhere, you know, on a stadium seat cushion at yeah. Georgia Tech. People know a lot more about anthrax and Ebola and norovirus and plague than they do about all these other things. And the reason they know about it is because, you know, they kill people, right? I mean, so they've heard lots about all these bad microbes. In fact, those are the only ones they normally hear about most of the time. And so the whole, one of the points of this was, okay, look, everywhere we went, you can find all these other organisms and Many of them, they actually do something. They have a biological function that could be useful or important or interesting. We shouldn't ignore them. Epidemiology, where people follow people over time, they've known for a long time that things like the exposure to dirt or the exposure to animals or the cleanliness has a beneficial effect on your risk to certain what you could call microbe-related properties. There's been this thing called the hygiene hypothesis, which says that, especially when people are young, when the immune system is developing, the dirtier you are, the lower the risk of problems with the immune system. And that would include things like autoimmune diseases, like type 1 diabetes, which I have. You know, there's hundreds of autoimmune disorders, and now they think obesity is in the same type of condition, an inflammation condition where the immune system is not working in quite the right way, and allergy, and asthma. And all of these things, you have a lower risk if you're dirtier. But people haven't really understood the mechanism behind that. There have been hypotheses, but in the last 10 years, maybe, there's been much more suggestive or convincing evidence that the mechanism behind that is introducing more microbial diversity. And that if you do the opposite, if you reduce microbial diversity by being born by C-section. So vaginal birth delivers microbes to the baby. It probably exists in part to deliver microbes to babies. If you get born by C-section, you don't get that microbial bolus from your mother. So C-section is a way of reducing microbial diversity. Taking antibiotics when you're young is a way of reducing microbial diversity. Avoiding dirt, uh, being germophobic or overly clean also reduces microbial diversity. And there's growing evidence that that causes problems with the development of the immune system, which in turn leads to the higher risk of all of these ailments. The evidence is very suggestive that at least a component of these ailments is driven by not having the normal colonization of microbes that the immune system expects based upon our evolutionary history. And so dirt is filled 
with microbes. I mean, all sorts of different microbes. But the, the microbial diversity in dirt, I mean, one little gram of dirt will have thousands of species of bacteria and probably hundreds of species of fungi. And, you know, just an incredible diversity in soil. Now, that doesn't mean that all of them are good, right? It's not that soil is like health food. But on average, if you go and scoop up soil when you're a kid and you coat yourself in it, right? On average, getting dirty is better for you than being exceptionally clean. That, again, doesn't mean if you live in a place where cholera is in the soil or, right? I mean, it's a complicated thing. Humans are very complicated. All of our cities are different. All of our farms are different. So the epidemiology tells us what happens on average. And this risk factor tells us sort of relatively what it does to your risk of particular conditions. And what people are trying to figure out now is what is the mechanism behind that? Can we recapitulate that in a controlled situation by delivering just the good parts of this to a person, a plant, or to an animal? So this is the UC Davis Genome Center. It's a mix of people who do basically high technology, high throughput biology. So this is my lab area. You can see there's probably one or two grad students around. Um, it is Friday in California, you know, so. <laughs> she helps run the system here. These are, looks like, seagrass samples, so we're doing studies of seagrass. We're interested in the general rules by which microbial communities interact with each other or interact with a host, like a plant or an animal. And what we're interested in is comparing lots of systems to each other. You know, Sonia over there is interested in am amphibians and the microbes that live in and on them, and we have people working on cats, and we had a Kickstarter campaign on the kitten microbiome, and we have people working on grapes and corn and rice and koalas and seagrass. And we would like to look at thousands upon thousands upon thousands of plants and compare the microbes that are on those plants from across the northern hemisphere and compare the different genotypes of the plants and compare different species of the plants. And then on those thousands of samples characterize the microbes that were in those thousands of samples. Five years ago that would have been too expensive to do because the DNA sequencing for that would have cost millions and millions of dollars. Now the DNA sequencing is cheap but we need to figure out ways to process all of those samples. DNA sequencing has gotten so cheap and so efficient. What we're limited now in is how many samples we can process. So this is one of Chris's efforts into trying to figure out ways to do things in a more automated, high-throughput manner. It is a vast, unexplored, fascinating landscape that's out there. We know more than we did five years ago but I would argue that we know virtually nothing still. If you go to any environment and you scoop up a sample, wherever you go, even on humans, which have been very well studied, you will find new things each time you do this. So we have not even remotely scratched the surface of understanding the total number of microbes that are on the planet. So this is like, imagine the first explorer showing up in Madagascar and getting a sample of four vertebrates and two insects and thinking you understand the diversity of Madagascar. That's where we're at now. Oh my god, I have a billion butterflies <laughs> in here. Oh wow. Magic Butterfly Garden 2002. Yes. Saxton's River. So these are all ground up. This, I cut out their abdomens and studied the DNA and the microbes in their guts. Here's the card with the things I isolated DNA from. Pieris rapi, that's the cabbage butterfly. Vanessa cardui. These are all beetles. So you just collected bugs. When I was going to work on butterflies, 
I was interested in insect biodiversity because they were neglected. You know, there were lots of millions <laughs> of them. I started doing collections and DNA studies of them. You know, microbes, once I found out about them, that was you know, even crazier. I just love diversity. I mean, that's right. <laughs> microbes are where it's at for diversity. This is a drawing I made when I was an undergrad at Harvard on the first piece of microbial DNA that I sequenced. It took me a year and a half. And at the time, it was a big deal to read this string of letters. And now we can do 100 million of those in six hours. In the 1970s, this very famous microbiologist, Carl Woese, discovered that there was a third hidden branch on the tree of life. He went to a collection of microorganisms, cracked them open, and painstakingly read the string of letters that make up this molecule and discovered that there was this extra branch on the tree of life that nobody had known anything about. And that sort of created this massive revolution in microbiology where people realized that we could figure out how microbes are related to each other. People had sort of said, it's impossible, it's so hard, you know, they're so simple, they don't have enough features, they don't have all these bones, they don't have all these morphologies. And he showed that you could do this. And this is not just an exercise in evolutionary biology. If you have a new microbe, you want to know what it is. Just like if you go out and see a bird, if you don't know what the bird is, you're going to have a hard time predicting its biology. That is a vulture, turkey vulture looking for <laughs> dead rabbits. I'm an ex-recovering okay. birder. I collect field guides to birds. <laughs> I also used to work on butterflies, and I've done field work on insects. These field guides are amazing because if you take one of them and I see a bird, I can figure out what it is by looking at the appearance. This map will tell me where they're supposed to live at different times of the season. This text will tell me what they do, what they eat, how they mate, how they behave. We can learn a lot by just walking around with binoculars to a new field site, and I can tell you within you know, an hour of the types of birds found in a new field site. I can't do that with microbes without DNA sequencing. So the same thing that I would do with binoculars with birds, we do with DNA sequencing. And that's our sampling method. And what I want to do, what many of my colleagues want to do, is make something like this a field guide, but for the hundreds of millions of kinds of microbes that are on the planet. Now, it'll be big. It's, you know, a ridiculous task at some level. But that's what we need to do to understand the microbes that live on your skin and in your gut and in your mouth and on corn plants and in soil. And it's not just sort of an esoteric exercise. They're driving the chemical cycles on the planet. They're running carbon fixation. They're affecting all the greenhouse gases. They're affecting the health of all the plants, of all the agricultural systems. They affect our health, our nutrition, our metabolic rate, our resistance to infection. And it's not that people haven't thought about this before, but we couldn't do it till the last few years. Everybody else on this floor studies microbes that live in the gut or in the mouth or in other orifices in humans. But there are a lot of people here who study you know, how the microbes in the gut protect from salmonella infections, uh -huh. or how the microbes in the stomach cause stomach cancer. Yeah, yeah. Most people spend 90% of their time indoors, yet most of the scientific work on microbial communities has been those outdoors. On any surface, like a counter or a wall or a floor, those are going to get coated with microbes. So buildings aren't sterile, right, when they start out. And then, like in a hospital, for example, there are microbes everywhere. That's good and bad, it turns out. You don't want the pathogens to be there. But if you sterilize the whole hospital, there are many people who think that actually that's going to be worse because it opens up the environment for any pathogen to grow. And what you really want is the good microbes to be hanging out there to keep the pathogens out. So this is where the toys are. So these are robots for processing samples, mostly. And then these are some of the DNA sequencing machines. And this little chip can read the DNA sequence from like 40 million pieces of DNA in a few hours. The amount of data that comes off of this, and the cost, it's so cheap, just completely amazing. I'm still flabbergasted by the whole thing. I mean, it just, 
so in any environment that you go to, so for example, drywall, there are lots of things that live in an on drywall. And what you don't want in an on drywall is black mold. So what you want to do is try and enhance the bacteria and fungi that don't produce toxins so that they dominate the ecosystem. And the same is true for a floor or the air around us or a house or in a daycare center or in a car or in an airplane. So what we're learning is that this effort to kill every microbe, to destroy the entire microbial communities in all these places has probably been misguided. I mean, obviously, you don't want to get Ebola. You don't want to get SARS. You don't want to get MRSA from the countertop. But the response to the presence of pathogens has been to kill everything. And that, you know, to me is the equivalent of saying, well, mountain lions have been killing some of our sheep. Let's burn down the forest. Right? I mean, that's what we're literally doing. We, we have a few things that are causing problems, and we have clear cut the entire ecosystem as our response to it. And there's other evidence from the human gut from skin, even from buildings, that there may be probiotic organisms, beneficial microbes in those systems, that they're not just filling spaces. So in the gut, there are microbes that reduce inflammation. And there are microbes that seem to be producing vitamins and cofactors and other metabolites that the host needs. The same is probably true in the air, in the floor, in the water, in a building. And so again, sterilizing those systems is not a wise approach. Guy in my lab made a board game, a, a microbiome really? board game. It's called Gut Check. And so basically you have events that transport microbes, like a you know bus, bus trip. trip, and then you can get a fecal transplant if you want to fix your microbes, and then you can get antibiotic resistance. Here's lactobacillus, which makes vitamin B12, so that can increase your health. Here's another organism, a bacteroides, that helps you digest cellulose. And you can get a pathogen. This is a thing that causes leprosy. And then there's organisms that can make, you can make an organism resistant to antibiotics. Salmonella. There's another pathogen, botulism. There's a million different things in here. You can give someone an infection. So there's a whole collection of these, and they're all based upon some paper or papers or data that, you know, say that that organism has that but the fact here is there's probably a couple papers that say that Mycovibrio reginus avarus has some beneficial effect on protecting from infection. Homeopathy. Has no effect whatsoever. Another thing that I fight is what I call microbiomania, which is overselling the microbiome. So yes, the microbiome on humans and plants and animals has profound effects on health and well-being. But we don't know exactly what is causing those effects. And we generally don't know how to manipulate the microbiome of any individual. You can have probiotics. Yeah. And what's that? Is that a positive or is that a... Right? It's a subtle positive. Saying that someone with Crohn's disease should have sauerkraut or should have kimchi or whatever, most of these, there's not a lot of evidence that they work at that level. You put it. And you put it right here. That being said, as a default, increasing the diversity of your microbial community and your diet is a smart thing to do given what we know right now. So I would recommend that people introduce Fermented foods, especially those with a history of being not damaging to your health, it's not clear how much they're beneficial, but it might help keep your system from getting too disturbed by things that happen in your life. For example, having yogurt after taking antibiotics. You should probably have it before you take antibiotics too. Now, one thing that's the problem with all of this, with probiotics, and with the fermented food treatments is that most of the microbes that go into your system get killed in the stomach. I mean, some make it through, but it's a very small fraction. And most of the ones that make it through don't outcompete the things that are already there. And so I think the alternative might be foods for microbes. 
that are going to be in, you know, like fiber, and what's called prebiotics. And if you manipulate that, you're using the things that are already living in your system. You're not trying to introduce stuff and get it through your stomach, right? Again, there's not a lot of evidence of how to do this. Most of the people claiming stuff are lying. The concept is OK. The details are what we don't know a lot about. So the one area where there's a lot of decent data on now is infants. And there's a lot more information in the last few years on even the possibility that microbes might be being delivered via breastfeeding. Fecal transplants, swapping out the entire microbial community. People with these persistent gut infections by this one bacteria called Clostridium difficile, also known as C. diff, they can be on antibiotics for 10 years and not be better. They can have persistent gut problems that will kill them. And if you take fecal matter from a healthy donor and deliver it to someone with one of these C. diff infections, there's like a 95% cure rate of the C. diff infection. Now, we don't know what does that exactly, right? It is something in the donor microbial community that is squeezing out the C. diff in some way. But we don't know how that happens. Here's one that there, I know the paper's on. So lactobacillus acidophilus is one of the organisms that helps you digest lactose. And then there are opportunistic organisms. So these can be good or bad depending on the circumstances. The challenge with the science is in many cases, individual organisms have been found to have a beneficial effect in a few people. The science is moving in the direction that a lot of medicine is, which is called personalized medicine. What you have to do is really study each person as an individual. But the problem is that everybody is different. The human diversity is immense. So many variables that the fact that in you know, five papers someone showed that some organism, you know, one of these beneficial microbes like lactobacillus can digest milk, that doesn't mean that introducing it to a person is going to have a beneficial effect. Some people are trying to develop ways to kill microbes via viruses that kill those microbes. It's called phage therapy. As far as I can tell, it's the most complicated area of human medicine right now. Right? There are 10,000 species that live in and on you, and each of them have hundreds of genetic variants. Each of them come in different forms, and they fluctuate in abundance over time and over space and within families and across buildings. And each of those organisms, here's, they evolve while they're inside you. So, so, I mean, this is incredibly complex. We are getting to the point where people can now look at the microscopic world. What is that? This, this is a camera. For me. To collect the bugs. Okay. And they now have cell phone microscopes, right? We now have for a couple so, of dollars. There is something going on in here. Can he amplify the impact? Oh, yeah, oh, you yeah. can amplify oh, And it's really cool. Look at that. There's something moving in there. Oh, my God, there. that's great. You see, you see this face? Mm -hmm. You see the little the little things just going crazy down here? They just keep moving, huh? Oh my gosh. Look at that one there. If you look at the diversity of organisms on the planet, the vast majority of the different branches in the evolutionary tree spend their entire lives as single-celled organisms that you can't see without a microscope. Most of the diversity of life is, are microorganisms. And they're actually really cool. It's just that we normally don't look at them. Queen Holly Blossom, Queen Holly Blossom, Queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kids in elementary school go out and look at the bugs. They go out and look at the flowers. They don't go out and look at the microbes. They should. You want to be a king? <laughs> I mean, they, they should. No, I'm not doing that. You look at them then. 
because they're interesting and important and they play profound roles in their lives and we can now look at them. Bugs on you. Where do the bugs come from? Oh, left. They're in your mouth? You have bugs in your mouth? We have rose They're tiny though, right? Mm hmm. They're inside the of bubbles. When I was a kid, we had little magnifiers to look at the beetles. And that was really cool to see them close up and to see ants and their mandibles and other things. So now you can basically start to do that with microbes and they're actually really cool. It's just that we normally don't look at them. I went to graduate school to work on butterflies. That butterfly there is in that group. They're called the sulfur butterflies. So one of the reasons I like birds and one of the reasons I like butterflies is there have been so many amateur scientists who have collected them and collected data about them and shared data about them. So we have incredible maps of where every butterfly is supposed to be over 150 years. My dream for microbes is to try and mimic those communities. I know it's not right. I'm going to put it on my sleeve. You're up. We want to get everybody to think about microbes and to participate in building this map of all the microbes. So right now, people can't do DNA sequencing at home. So they have to send a sample off to somewhere else. But in, I would bet in five years and probably sooner, people will be able to do the DNA sequencing at home. You see the circle there, Shimena? Did you just keep moving, huh? And then we can have a billion people building a global microbial map. Oh my gosh. Look at that one there. Uh, how about this one, this one, this one? Look, look, look. I don't want to convince people that all microbes are good, that we shouldn't kill them some of the time. But that doesn't mean that at the same time you want to spread triclosan all over your arm just because you got a little scrape. I would like to have the general knowledge of microbes be better. For example, antibiotics. We already know that antibiotics over usage is leading to resistant organisms spreading throughout the planet. Now we have a second risk of antibiotics, which is slaughtering the microbial communities that are in and on systems. So with those two things together, antibiotics should be much more carefully used. Again, I use them. Antibiotics are amazing things that have saved millions and millions of lives, yeah. but they're completely abused. In many countries, they just shuffle antibiotics into animal feed because they get fatter. We should probably do fewer C-sections. I mean, people do C-sections because the doctor wants to get home by 2 p.m. That's deranged. But I believe that education is an important component. The more people love birds, the more they protect the environment around them. I mean, hunters are among the biggest conservationists in the United States because they want to keep the <laughs> bird diversity around. I believe that at least as a baseline, educating policymakers and the public and MDs and everybody about microbial communities is important. But I think discussing this with the public, getting them to be microbiologists, to get engaged. See, I bet. And to really do things correctly, I mean, you know, ecologists have been struggling with understanding tropical rainforests for a long time. Can I see books? They're, they're hard, they're complicated. They're hundreds of organisms interacting with each other, co-evolving. The gut is like that, the skin is like that, the mouth is like that.